Okay. So, um, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Brian, uh, for that introduction. Uh, my name is Fred Ronquist. I'm at the Swedish Museum of Natural History in Stockholm. But uh, I'm also the uh, IBA uh, project leader, and I'll kick off this uh, symposium by uh, talking about the Insect Biome Atlas project and how it all uh, started. So, uh, in, in one way, you can say that this, it started with this simple question. How many insect species are there in Sweden? And we've been researching the insect fauna of Sweden for 300 years since Carl Linnaeus started uh, describing species. Uh, and still, uh, scientists really can't answer that question properly, which is uh, shocking in a way. And, and so why is that? Well, it's because, you know, what we think insects look like is th this, you know, the big things like big beetles, butterflies, things that we see very easily, discover very easily. Even biologists and even a lot of entomologists focus on these groups. So a lot of the knowledge is about these groups. But actually, most insects don't look like this. Most insects, they look like this. They're small, inconspicuous, uh, and they belong to the groups Diptera, uh, the flies, mosquitoes, midges, gnats, or they belong to the group Hymenoptera. They're sawflies, bees, wasps, and ants. And you see some typical representatives here. This is a, a fly, a mosquito, and a lot of the Hymenopterans, they're parasitic wasps. Okay, so why is it important to know all of these uh, species, and particularly in the poorly known groups? Well, so almost all the knowledge we have is about the big insects. And all, virtually all environmental monitoring we do today is focused on these uh, big insects, and actually only a on a small fraction of the species that belong to those groups. But the small and inconspicuous insects, they deliver the most important ecosystem services, uh, things like decomposing organic matter, controlling the population of pest species, uh, and actually they do a lot of the pollination work as well. Uh, and as I've uh, mentioned, we don't know how, even how many uh, they are not even, uh, and uh, much less what they do in e the ecosystems, and not even in a country like Sweden. And they're uh, practically never monitored, so we don't know how, what, what the, uh, the changes look like in their populations. So if you want to learn more about these groups, uh, what do you do? Although you, um, you use these uh, traps, which are very effective, particularly in capturing uh, these uh, small and incons inconspicuous uh, uh, flying uh, insects. It, this is known as a malaise trap, and it looks like a tent, and essentially um, the, what you do is you, you imagine that you remove the sides of a tent, and instead you place a central panel uh, in, in that uh, tent, and what happens is the insects fly into this uh, uh, trap, and then they encounter the central panel and they try to escape. And they escape by, by searching uh, for light, right? So they're going upwards and you strengthen this uh, response by having a light roof of the tent. So they go upwards and you build that like, like a funnel and then you collect the insects in a jar at the top. Extremely efficient at capturing uh, insects. Uh, the trap was invented by this guy, René Malaise. Uh, he was an entomologist, explorer, um, world expert on sawflies, and he was uh, actually a senior curator at the Swedish Museum of Natural History in, in Stockholm. There's a lot of interesting things to tell about him, but uh, I, I don't have time to do that. Okay, so in Sweden, uh, we started something uh, called the Swedish Malaise Trap Project uh, in 2003. Uh, three years, we were running 75 traps at 50-something uh, sites across covering the entire country. And it looks, looked a little bit like this. So this is a trap from northern Sweden. It's another trap from northern Sweden. Yeah. Different environments all over the country. In southern Sweden, we actually collect insects also in the middle of winter when we have lots of snow. A few insects are active during that time period. <coughs> 
So you can easily collect a lot of material. Then there's a lot of work in sorting that uh, material to groups that can be sent out to taxonomists, taxonomists experts on different groups of organisms around the world. And the results have been spectacular, uh, even for Sweden, where we thought we knew the insect fauna to a you know, fairly high extent, large extent. So uh, we estimate we collected around 20 million insects uh, over uh, this, uh, this time period. Uh, okay. So in the 15 years or so that has passed since we ended the field campaign, we've identified 1% uh, of the species to, it's still 200,000 specimens. So There's a lot of specimens, but still only 1% of the entire material. That represents in total four, almost 4,000 species. And it's focused, of course, on the poorly known uh, groups. That's, and you see what we find a lot of new things. So 1,300 new species records for Sweden. About half of them are also new to science. Now, really uh, surprising, even for us working with uh, insects. Almost all of the new species are in this, these groups I talked about, Diptera and Hymenoptera. Um, most of them are decomposers or parasitoids of other insects, delivering essential ecosystem services. Uh, and extra we can extrapolate and try to predict how many species are still remaining to be discovered in Sweden. And it's 5,000 more species. 28,000 are known uh, today. But what's really depressing is the time this takes. Identifying the entire material we, com we um, predict is going to take at the current speed, it's going to take 750 years. I mean, there's no way we want to monitor the changes over time. So we need to do this continuously, right? So there's no way we can use these methods. And I, I can mention here that this has been tried, similar projects have been tried in several other countries, including Madagascar. Brian is running a very similar project here in Madagascar, and the experience has been exactly the same. So, we need new methods. And now we have those uh, new methods. And they're based on genetic identification of the material that we collect. And it's called, specifically it's called DNA metabarcoding, uh, the method that we use. So what we do is we extract DNA from uh, an environmental sample, uh, for instance, uh, from a malestra. It can also be a soil sample, it can be a water sample, or something similar, sample from the environment. Then we uh, extract DNA from that and we amplify a care carefully chosen gene, part of the genome, which it can be used for species identification. And we, we use the PCR reaction, poly polymerase chain uh, reaction. So this is followed by uh, DNA sequencing. Uh, and uh, so we can sequence all gene copies from all organisms in the sample in, a se in one go with these modern uh, sequencing machines. And then we use computers to group those sequences into species. Uh, and these, uh, we can m name those species by matching them against a reference library. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, and we get the species inventory uh, for uh, that uh, sample that we collected. And in this way, we can process thousands of samples and millions of specimens in weeks. So this, is a completely, this has completely revolutionized our ability to survey and also monitoring uh, entire uh, insect faunas. So this is what we're using in the Insect Biome Atlas uh, project. We're comparing Sweden and Madagascar. And we're asking four uh, different fundamental questions. What's the composition of the insect faunas of Sweden and Madagascar? We're interested, where do the insects come from? And this is an interesting contrast because the insects have completely different histories in Sweden and Madagascar. In Sweden, we're all recent, including humans, we're all recent immigrants because it was uh, covered by ice not long ago, Sweden. So, so a lot of this is very recent, only something like 12,000 years ago uh, we colonized, or these species colonized Sweden. In Madagascar, a lot of the diversity evolved in place. A lot of the species 
evolved here in Madagascar. They have millions of years of history uh, in Madagascar. Then we're interested in how the insects contribute to ecosystem functions, how the, the health, if you wish, of these natural uh, systems. And finally, we're also interested in the microorganisms that are associated with uh, the insects. And you'll hear more about that uh, later. So why did we choose Sweden and why Madagascar? There are several uh, answers to that, of course. But we start with Sweden. So it's one of the smallest and most well-known national insect faunas in, in the world. It's a good starting point from that uh, 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 perspective. And in particular, it's an excellent way of testing these new inventorying and monitoring methods. We can benchmark them against fairly well-known insect fauna. Mm -hmm. And then why Madagascar? Well, many reasons, uh, again. But uh, it's an interesting comparison because it's about the same size as Sweden. Uh, it's a completely different climate, geology, and history, as I mentioned. It's one of the largest insect faunas uh, in the world. And this thing I mentioned, so most species evolved in place in Madagascar. All species migrated recently uh, to Sweden, so very different histories. And it's an excellent first contrast on the way to global service, global comparisons of insect faunas and monitoring of what's happening with the insect faunas. So this is uh, just quickly before we focus all of our attention on Madagascar, a little bit from some glimpses from the Swedish part of the project. So this is what, uh, what it looked like. Lots of traps covering the countries. Specifically, you have the numbers here. So we had uh, running uh, through a, an entire year, January to December 2019. We had almost 200 traps at 100 sites. 150 volunteers helped us uh, to uh, manage those uh, traps. We collected in total 5,000 samples from these traps. We collected also a lot of data, but we'll, you will see the Madagascar example later uh, in the workshop. So just going to give you a few um, of the results, so, which might be interesting. So for Sweden, we collected 26 kilos of insects in total in those uh, traps, so about 3 million uh, specimens, uh, we estimate. And with these new methods, uh, just to illustrate how revolutionary this is, with 10 staff, 10 people, and two of these NovaSec machines that uh, analyze these uh, samples, many samples at, at, in one go, uh, this material could have been analyzed and processed, identified to species in weeks, instead of seven, from 750 years to weeks. And the cost is much, it's a fraction of what it takes. If, if you include the, the salaries of all those taxonomic experts, that we use in the traditional way. This is just a fraction of the cost. In total, in Sweden, we found 26,000 in uh, species uh, in our samples. These are, uh, we're still in the, um, uh, in the process of analyzing data. So these are preliminary numbers, but anyway. Um, and if we want to assess the quality, we can use Lep Lepidoptera. Lepidoptera fauna is really well known in Sweden. We don't expect to see any new species. Uh, and um, we'll see. Uh, what the data looks like. So we, it seems that we have captured in our traps, they have not been optimized to collect Lepidoptera diversity, and actually Malaise traps are thought to be relatively poor at capturing Lep Lepidoptera. Still, we've collected 50%, so half of the Swedish known fauna of Lepido Lepidoptera. Uh, and it turns out, if you look at this, it has 85 to 90% accuracy in identifying these uh, two species. So almost the same as a, a, a taxonomist. You have a really good expert taxonomist to be, beat that number. And surprisingly, we also find a handful of new species records uh, for Sweden. They're no, not new to science, but new uh, records uh, for Sweden. So that's surprising. And in other groups of insects, we find a lot of new species for Sweden, and uh, uh, in particular, uh, the group uh, Diptera. We have around 13,000 species of Diptera identified with these methods, and uh, we have only 8,000 something known species of uh, Diptera in Sweden. Uh, and uh, we have, in previous extrapolations, we were expecting 10,000 species. So even in Sweden, we're discovering a lot of new uh, species records, and, and a lot of them are also new to science, I'm sure. 
But the bottom line here is we have a cheap, effective, and accurate method of serving insect faunas. We have a baseline now for Sweden, and we have one for Madagascar too. And we need to start monitoring changes over time. So I'll end my talk by, talk, by just uh, have you think a little bit about who benefits the most from these efforts. What group of people benefits the most? Well, actually, that question has many answers. Uh, so I think uh, perhaps the most important answer is, I mean, if you're worried about the long-term survival of mankind, these efforts are essential. We have... We don't have the tools now to follow what happens with, all, with most of biodiversity. We're just following a small fraction of it. So these methods are essential for anyone interested in sustainable development and in the long-term survival of mankind. But I'd li like to mention two specific examples of groups. Uh, so one is um, fairly obvious. So if you're managing a uh, national park, uh, if you're managing something where biodiversity is, you know, the, so the so sort of reason that you do this, then, of course, these methods are essential because they allow you to follow what's happening with biodiversity broadly. Insects constitute, you know, a very large proportion of the animal, uh, terrestrial animal uh, diversity. And th these methods, you really need these methods to, to, ha to monitor what's happening with that if you... Uh, um, you're interested in uh, exploring different ways of managing the national park, which is, what methods are good for diversity and what methods are not so good. You have external threats. Are they decreasing the diversity or increasing and, and things like that, invasive species. But another, I would, I'd like to uh, mention another group which is more unexpected perhaps. So, um, so these methods now are attracting a lot of attention from investors. Uh, from people working in financial markets. And do you know what, uh, why? Well, it's because, uh, for several reasons. So people are looking for sustainable business models. And it has to do with return of investment. If you want a return on your investment and you want to minimize the risk, if you're, especially if you're managing a retirement fund, you don't want to take a lot of risks. So it's important to have a sustainable development model. And these people, they're looking a lot now at the climate impact of businesses, right? If you're doing, you want to see, you want to invest in businesses that have a net zero or even positive impact on, on climate. And now they're starting to look at uh, biodiversity in the same way. So they want to measure biodiversity impact of businesses and their activities. And they need methods that are cheap, effective, objective, they're transparent, they're auditable, and this is exactly what these methods will provide them. And we see now a, a growing number of projects trying to develop these methods that allow investors to measure the biodiversity impact of businesses. And this is just one example uh, of a project where uh, I'm involved in trying to help global investors uh, to um, assess um, biodiversity impact of businesses. And one thing people are talking about is uh, biodiversity markets. So basically the idea is a business does something that's bad for biodiversity in one spot, so they can compensate for that by doing something that's good for biodiversity somewhere else. And is there a better way of doing that than investing in biodiversity in Madagascar? I think it's, uh, it's just going to be a lot of interest in that in the near future. With that, I'd like to acknowledge all of the lovely people here in Madagascar has been helping us with uh, uh, this, uh, this project. Uh, just uh, thank you very much, and our funders, of course, so thank you. <laughs>